Good morning, Year 7 and 8. Miss Price here. I have to say I'm very impressed with all the work that you have been doing already, especially the students sending me in um, practical pictures, the practicals I've been sending. It's been fantastic. Today we're going to be bringing ideas together from things you've learned about at home. Um, you're going to need a pen and a paper, so I'll give you a, a few minutes to go and collect those. Okay, so today's lesson is going to be um, explaining natural selection. We've got three questions to do first of all for the do now, where you're going to link ideas from things you've done at home. So question one, what is meant by variation? Question two, think about your friends and family what variation can you see? And question three, think about a cheetah. What features help it to survive? Okay, we're going to mark that now. So, variation is differences between um, individuals within a species or differences um, between species. So your friends and family, um, there's lots of variation in people. So you could have said different hair colour, different skin colour, eye colour, different height, different weights. There's lots of different things you could have said, different accents. So the cheetah um, is very fast. It's got um, sharp teeth. It's got claws, all to be able to catch its prey. It's got a very good camouflage as well, so it can sneak up onto its prey. So hopefully you've got all of those answers correct. Give yourself a mark out of three and a pat on the back if you've got three. Well done. So if you've completed all of your home learning tasks, these are the topics that we would have copied, um, you would have covered so far. So we've learned about cells, and part of the cells topic, you would have learned about the nucleus. And inside that nucleus, you know that you've got DNA. Every living thing has got to have DNA in order to survive. And it is the um, most important molecule for life. We then have had a look at variation, which we've just reminded ourselves what it is. And it is differences between species or differences within a species. We've also looked at adaptations and how are animals and plants adapted to where they live. So what makes them special to be able to survive where they live. We've had a brief look at evolution and we're going to bring ideas with that today. We've also looked at extinction and endangered species, food chains and food webs, and sampling techniques where lots of you did nice practicals. So we're going to be bringing all of these ideas in together today. Okay, just looking at these two pictures then. Which crocodile would be more likely to survive for longer? And why do you think that? Just write a couple of answers down. Okay, hopefully you could see that this one has obviously got more teeth. Therefore, it's going to be able to survive for longer. Now, if this crocodile can survive for longer, it's more likely to be able to find more mates to breed with. It's more likely to be able to have more offspring. Now, those of you that have been doing the work at home know that offspring is just the scientific word for children, babies. Um, the offspring is what is produced after an animal or plant has reproduced. So this crocodile would survive for longer, therefore have more offspring. Now those offspring, those crocodile babies, are likely to have sharp teeth because the parent crocodile had sharp teeth. Looking at this shark then as another example of how an animal is adapted to survive. Have a quick think and jot some ideas down. How do you think this animal is adapted to help it to survive? Ok, 
Okay, well done. Hopefully, you've said it's quite camouflaged, so it can easily sneak up onto its prey. It's very streamlined, um, which means it can swim fast because it can cut through the water and reduce the air resistance, the water resistance, sorry. And also, it's going to have very sharp teeth so that it can catch its prey. Now, with an animal that's very well adapted, again, it's likely to live longer, therefore have more offspring, and those offspring are likely to have inherited those brilliant adaptations in order to survive. This is quite a crazy looking cute frog found in the rainforest in Costa Rica. Have a quick think and jot some ideas down of how you think this animal is adapted to help it to survive. Now as you can see this animal is very well camouflaged. It can't be seen. It is a prey animal so animals will eat it if it can be seen. So this animal is very good at hiding from its predators. Because it's so good at hiding from its predators it should be able to live a long time, produce more offspring and those offspring are likely to have the same camouflage because the genes are inherited from this parent and therefore the offspring will live longer and also pass those genes on. So we're going to look at a specific species that does come up um, in a lot of examples and it's the peppered moth. Now you might think moths are boring and I actually thought the same until learning about this um, story with the peppered moths and how you can quite clearly see evidence of natural selection. So, evidence, um, sorry, evolution is a change in a species over time, which you have done about in previous topics if you've done your home learning. And it was Charles Darwin that first came up with the theory of natural selection. So we're going to use this peppered moth story to show you what natural selection is. Okay, so these moths, there's two types of moths. There's a light moth and a dark moth. They are both peppered moths. So think about these two points. What would cause these two moths to look different and therefore show variation? What do you think each of these moths' parents may have looked like? So hopefully you know that the differences between these two moths, the variation you can see within this moth species, is um, going to be down to the genetics. This moth will have the gene for the lighter coloured skin and this moth would have the gene for the darker coloured skin. So it's very likely that the moth's parents would have had the same genes and the same colouring. So it's very likely that this moth had light coloured parents and this moth had dark coloured parents. I'm going to do a task now. Um, if you've had me as a teacher, you would have done several times before, and if not, don't worry. It's um, an easy task to do, and it's called Pictures from Stories. I'm going to read you 11 sentences, and you're not allowed to write down any words at all. You're only allowed to draw a really rough sketch of the sentence I am saying, and you should be able to use your pictures to retell your story. Now, before I begin that, don't worry, it's only rough work this is. Um, I can't draw moths. These were my pictures of moths, just so it's just note form so you can see. So this is obviously representing my light coloured moth. This is obviously representing my dark coloured moth. But feel free if you wish to draw better moths than me, which really wouldn't be difficult. What's also important to point out so that you understand the story before we begin is that these moths live on birch trees which are actually white coloured trees, light coloured trees and you need to know that so keep this picture of a moth inside your head um, sorry the picture of this tree inside your head whilst we go through the story so that you can understand what the story is okay so you need a pen and paper no words at all 
I'm just going to draw two sketches. Now this picture here is going to represent this, the first one. This is what I would have drawn to the, for the first one. So you can put a number one so you can keep track. We're going to begin. So number one. There are two varieties of peppered moth. A dark coloured moth and a light coloured moth. So that was number one. Draw a quick sketch to show the two types of moth. Number two. The light coloured moth sits on the tree, which is the white birch tree. White birch tree. It can't be seen. It's camouflaged. So number two was, light coloured moth sits on the tree and it can't be seen, it's camouflaged. Number three, birds can't see them, so they are not eaten. So number three, the birds cannot see the white moth, so they are not eaten. Number four, the light coloured moths therefore live longer and are able to have more offspring and those offspring are also likely to be light coloured. So number four again was, the light moths therefore live longer and are able to have more offspring which are also likely to be light coloured. Number five, the light coloured moths are therefore more common than the dark coloured moths. That was number five, the light ones are more common than the dark ones. Number six, the dark ones were not camouflaged, so they were the ones that were eaten by the birds. That's why there's less of them. That was number six. The dark ones were not camouflaged, so they were eaten by the birds, and that is the reason why they were more common. Sorry, less common. Number seven. However, the industrial revolution happened, and all the soot from all the factories turned the trees black. So number seven, however, the industrial revolution happened and the soot from the factories turned the trees black. Number eight, now the light ones stood out, they were no longer camouflaged and they were eaten by the birds. So that was number eight. Now the light ones stood out, so they were eaten by the birds. Number nine. The dark ones were now not seen, and they were camouflaged. So the dark ones were now not seen, and they were camouflaged. Number 10. This meant the dark ones were now more suited to the area. They now lived longer and had more offspring, which were also dark. So the dark ones were now more suited to the area. They would now live longer and they would have more offspring. Last one. The dark ones were now more common. dark ones were now more common. Okay so hopefully you've got 11 little sketches to be able to tell the story of natural selection of the peppered moth. So how nature has selected which moth is able to survive and therefore be more common. 
You've got nine questions to do now. You're going to self-mark these in a moment. It's worth pointing out you're going to be, um, for your task on Google Classrooms, writing a little piece of extended writing where you're going to use those pictures to retell your story in your own words. So keep them safe. But for now, just use them to help you to answer these questions. So question one. Which moth was the most common before the Industrial Revolution? Question two. Why were these moths the most common before the Industrial Revolution? Question three. What did the Industrial Revolution do to the trees? Question four. What did this mean for the white moth? Question five. So what happened to the black moths? So I'm talking about after the Industrial Revolution, what happened to the black moths? Question six. Why did this happen to the black moth? Question seven. What do you think might happen if we stopped producing as much pollution and the trees were no longer black? And this is what you can actually see in a lot of cities now where the pollution levels are dropping. Question eight. You can actually use animals such as a peppered moth as indicator species. This means you can count the number of the different moths in an area to use it to predict how polluted the air might be. Think back to the lesson that we did two weeks ago. What equipment would you use to capture the moth? one question nine would you rather live in an area with more white moths or more black moths and why okay guys am I going to mark your own work so question one the more common one before the industrial revolution was the white moth or the light colored moth why were these moths more common they were not seen by the birds, they were not eaten. Question three, the Industrial Revolution turned the trees black. Question four, what did this mean for the white moths or the light moths? They could now be seen, so they were eaten. So what happened to the black moths, the dark moths? The black moths became more common. Why did this happen to the black moths? They could now be camouflaged and less were seen and eaten by the birds. What do you think would happen if the pollution levels dropped? Well, the trees would become white again and the white moth would become more common. Well done if you got that one right. Question 8. How could you capture the moths so you could count them and see which was more common? Well, I would use a net to capture the moths, like a butterfly net. Now I personally would rather live where there's more white moths because it would mean there was less pollution. Well done. Okay, so natural selection is the driving force of the evolution of all living things. That peppered moth is a very good example where you can see natural selection over quite a short period of time. The giraffe, however, is another very, very exam good example of natural selection. 
You can see natural selection in animals like giraffes, but over a long period of time, millions of years. So originally, the giraffe would not have had a long neck, it would have had quite a short neck. But over time, the giraffe, over many different generations, would have had a longer and longer neck. So, we're going to answer these questions. This is quite, um, this is a bit harder than the other questions. You've got to really think for yourself. Apply your knowledge that you've just learned about the natural selection of the peppered moth and see if you can answer these questions. So, question one. Think about what a giraffe looks like and what adaptation does it have, which means it can reach the leaves higher up on the trees. Question two. If you can see variation within a giraffe, what would cause a giraffe to have a longer neck than the other giraffes? Question three. What originally would have caused the first giraffe to have a slightly longer neck? Think back to the lesson a few um, weeks ago. Beans with an N. You want another clue? Think X Men. Question four. If a giraffe has a longer neck, what can you suggest about its lifespan in comparison to giraffes with a shorter neck and why? Question five, what would you expect the number of offspring to be in a giraffe with a longer neck compared to the number of offspring of a giraffe with a shorter neck and why? Question six, if you were to look at the neck length of the giraffe with longer necks offspring what would you expect their neck length to be and why do you think that? Last one. If this happened over many generations, what would happen to the neck length over time? Right, we're going to mark that. So the adaptation giraffes have are long necks that can meet and uh, reach their, the leaves and the high trees. What would cause that giraffe to have a slightly longer neck is actually the genes in their DNA, which would cause it to have a long neck. Now the original long neck would have originally come from a mutation, which is a change in the DNA. Question four, the lifespan of a giraffe with a slightly longer neck would actually be longer. A giraffe with a longer neck will live longer because they will have more food available too. Number five, the number of offspring of a giraffe with a longer neck would be more because if they can live longer, they have more time to find a mate um, or find several mates in order to breed with them to have more offspring. If you were then, question six, if you were then to look at the offspring of that giraffe with a longer neck, the offspring would be more likely to also have the longer neck because it inherits the genes for the longer neck from its parents. Last one, the neck length would increase very gradually over time. So over millions of years and many generations you see the neck get slightly longer over time and this is another example of evolution by natural selection. So give yourself a mark out of seven for that and well done. Okay so 
those of you that have been using Google Classroom, um, there is a task in there now which is um, all about the peppered moth story. Now I think that you would have all done fantastic sketch cartoons for the task that we did. So I'd like you to use those to be able to type up your paragraph of your story of your peppered moth in your own words. I'd like you to use the keywords and you're going to get a mark for using each of these keywords correctly. So use the word predator, prey, camouflage, variety, offspring, survive, industrial revolution and pollution. You'll see those words here but they are also on the task sheet on Google Plus 3. I'm going to be marking this out of 10 and give you your detailed feedback that you have been give, getting from me. Um, you're also going to get a mark for spelling and a mark for the quality of your story so making sure you haven't missed any bits out which I'm sure that you wouldn't. I hope that you've enjoyed this lesson as much as me and I'll look forward to making another one next week. Have a great week guys, thank you, bye!